All right, so first thing is all of the materials that we're gonna need. Here on the bottom, we have regular vacuum bagging plastic. Uh, this doesn't stick to epoxy, and so you can use it as a work surface. And you'll also use this to put your uh, composite material inside the vacuum bag. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit later. Capton vacuum bag, so you can see the difference between the color, this is pink and this is orange. This is for if you want to put your part in the oven, uh, which we will not do for these labs, but you may be interested in for your own bridge. This is known as bleeder. It's a perforated cloth uh, and it's a, a little bit of a wicking material. So this helps to suck excess epoxy out of your part. This kind of cottony soft material is called breather um, and you use it to maintain airflow from the vacuum inlet uh, to all the parts of your piece. Uh, where you expect epoxy to be coming from. So this will definitely stick to everything if you get it in touch with epoxy. So just be sure that you have your piece separated by this uh, bleeder, also known as peel ply, to make sure it doesn't stick. Um, so that's the kind of supporting materials. And then for this lab, we'll be using either an aramid or glass fiber. This is uh, just fiberglass right here. and. You can see it's a, got a unidirectional orientation, so all of the fibers are oriented along the length. And then over here we have carbon fiber uh, that is the same uni orientation. We also have a lot of other fabrics. This is a woven 090 uh, aramid fiber, uh, and we have a lot of other things to choose from. All right, so the first thing you wanna do is use these scissors. You can use manual scissors, but these are much nicer, to cut off a large sheet of vacuum bag and that'll be your working surface so you don't get epoxy everywhere. Right. Also go ahead and cut your leader and cut whatever fiber you chose to use. And since we're making about a 10 by 10 square of composite, you can just size that appropriately. So let's say we'll do 10 inches up here, and then we'll cut this in half to make our multiple layer composite piece. If we want to make three layers, right, we'll just cut this into three pieces. So be sure you weigh your fabric material before you make your composite. This way you can figure out your volume fraction after you have the finished part. So whenever you make your own vacuum bag, um, you're going to want to judge the size of your finished part. Just kind of lay up the dry fabric and see you know, about how much vacuum bag you'll need. You'll need, the easiest way to do it is to make like a sandwich. So cut it twice as long as your part so that when you fold it over, you can easily put tacky tape around these borders and seal it up. So once you've sized up your vacuum bag, grab a roll of tacky tape. It's tacky with paper backing. And the easiest way I've found to do it is to go ahead and starting at one back corner edge. So again, since this is gonna be folded over, this will be the back corner. Just go leaving the paper on, unroll the tacky tape down. And when you get to the end, you can tear it off. Then, the other side, about the same length, and you just kind of press it down as you go. Try and zoom in here. Be sure using the reflection of the light off of the vacuum bag material, try and get the vacuum bag material as, as flat as possible. So if you have to back it off and then hold it down again as you lay it down carefully using the reflection to see if you have any wrinkles in there because any wrinkles are going to make your vacuum quality much lower and the vacuum pump's going to work harder and it's not going to be a good result. So then finally, once you do the two sides, you can peel up a little bit of the paper here, peel up a little bit of paper on this side, and then you'll come across with the last line of tacky tape and that will 
help you seal off the part inside the vacuum bag. So this tacky tape should give you an airtight seal after you have laid it up properly. It takes a little bit of practice. And I'm being sloppy about it, so you really want to see no wrinkles along here. And then finally what you'll do is whenever you're ready to bag it up, you'll just peel off the rest of the paper, fold this over, and push out all the wrinkles. The next thing you're going to want to do is get a plastic mixing cup and a stir. And with these, you're going to come over and get your matrix. In this case, we're using a two-part epoxy hardener mixture. And the volume ratios are pre-calculated such that one pump from each vessel gives you the right mixture. So for this, we might need two pumps of each. Usually, if you're not doing vacuum-assisted resin transfer molding, Vardum, which is what we're doing, you want to be careful about how much epoxy you use because, again, that will affect your volume ratio, volume fraction. But since we're going to be pulling out all the excess epoxy, we can be pretty liberal with how much epoxy we're putting on our part. So once you get the two pumps of each in here, just stir it up really well. Uh, and this is a slow hardener, so we have about 30 minutes before it starts to get really viscous and about an hour before it's unworkable. Okay, so now that you've gotten your epoxy mixture ready to go, lay out your first ply and making sure you know which orientation you have it in. You want to go ahead and pour the epoxy on, try and spread it around pretty evenly. And then with your mixing stick or with another mixing stick or with your gloved hands, just go ahead and spread this epoxy around, trying to make sure all of the dry fiber mat comes in contact with the epoxy. And if you coat off the edges a little bit, it's okay. What we're going to do for this lab and what you usually do after you make a part is you'll do some post-processing where you'll either take your piece over to a bandsaw and trim up all the rough edges or sand it or do some kind of finishing work on it. So the fact that we have kind of a sloppy initial product is not such a big deal. But again, we can be pretty generous with this epoxy because what you want to avoid is having dry spots or voids because that's where your stresses and loads are not going to be transferred between the matrix and the fiber. And that'll lead to less than optimal strength. So once you do it on one side, the easiest way to make sure that you have spread the epoxy really well, sometimes you get splinters in there, is to just pick up the part and flip it over to be sure and get the back side. Now you probably notice when I flip it over, if you can see it on the camera, the underside is not well coated either, right? So this is why you have to pay careful attention, spend a lot of time making sure that your epoxy is filling in all of the voids of your work part. So once you do this with a single layer, you're just going to repeat the process for however many other layers you intend. For the first lab, we're going to do two or three. Um, later labs will probably have you do some combination of different non-unidirectional plies or uni and cross plies. But essentially the process is the same for all the layers. Make sure you have your epoxy spread evenly. All of the fibers are well coated by the epoxy. And if you run out of epoxy, you can always go get more. But keep in mind, for big pieces, your epoxy is going to start curing as soon as you mix it together. So for very large pieces that are going to be co-cured, like your bridges for the final project, you have to be aware of the amount of time that you've been spending assembling all these pieces. So now that we have that first layer fully wetted with the epoxy, we can come in and add on 
second layer, making sure that the fiber orientation is the same for this first lab. But here's where you can do cross plies or angle plies or some other combination depending on the fiber uh, orientation design that you laid up. Continue spreading the epoxy, pour more epoxy on, spread it. Keep stacking layers up. And so as you add your layers, just be sure that whenever you put a new layer on that it lays flat with the layer below it. So sometimes you need to um, kind of stretch it in the transverse direction to lay these ridges down that sometimes form. Um, and then you also get epoxy coming up through which again helps make sure all of the fibers are fully wetted. And so then what you'll do is take the sheet of bleeder, this is the wicking material, and just lay it on top of your part. And if you have two layers on top, it's okay. Uh, you'll see already the epoxy is starting to be absorbed into the part. Um, and what the bleeder allows you to do is now create a channel with some breather cloth across the top of the part, right? So if we're going to have a vacuum port over here, we want to make sure that as the vacuum decreases the size of the bag, we don't get any air pockets in here. So by creating a channel with this kind of clothy material, uh, we can ensure that we don't have any air pockets in our finished part. But this stuff does stick like crazy to epoxy, so make sure it's not in contact with your finished part or else you're going to have a cottony, fluffy laughing stock of a piece. So once you've made a nice air channel with your breather cloth, you're going to want to sight where your vacuum fitting will go. Uh, this is a compression fitting. One side goes inside the vacuum bag, the other side goes outside, uh, and you'll cut a small X where you want your piece to rest. So I'm just going to fold this over to see whereabouts we need to cut our port. Right about there is fine. Just be sure you don't cut through the back side of the bag. And you can cut a little triangle or a little X just big enough for this fitting to go inside. Then you'll place the seat part inside the bag underneath the hole and insert the other part of the compression fitting and twist. And so you work your way around from one corner to the other. Sometimes you have to add a little bit of extra tacky tape if you misjudge. Uh, and the easiest way I've found to do it is kind of peel the paper backing off as you go. Uh, and it definitely helps to have an extra set of hands. But you kind of peel it off as you go and press the tacky tape down or press the vacuum bag down immediately to avoid letting these wrinkles kind of build up. And you can always go back after you do this and you're going to have to add tacky tape in there because there's a gap. Anywhere there's wrinkles you'll probably have to press down by hand, uh, but it's just a work in progress. Attach your fitting and you'll be ready to go. And so you can get a tool that lets you get a lot of leverage and listen for any hissing noise around the edge and then just come in, especially at the corners, and press that tape down to get a solid vacuum. You should get a good enough vacuum to where when you turn the pump off, it holds. Sometimes it doesn't, but in this case we have a pretty solid vacuum. And then finally, to make sure you have a flat finished product, since we're making plates, let's get some call plates and add some weight on top to make sure our finished piece is plain. And so everywhere epoxy touched will be very sticky, obviously. But you can see the difference between having vacuum bag material in contact with your part. Uh, we have some waves in here, so that's undesirable.
but the end result is a stiff part that you can peel away, peel by, and try and not rip it like that. But if you do, it's okay for this lab. And then you get a matte finish on the side that was in contact with the peel ply. We'll be cutting these on the bandsaw or with some scissors to about uh, 10 inch long by 1 inch wide test coupons for use on the MTS machine. Alright, so when making a test coupon just try and pick out a location that has no voids like right here and right here we can see it didn't get fully wetted uh, and you kind of can see it in the light a little bit better, better. And then pick also spots that don't have any waves or bends in them. And you can just use, for this thin sheet, you can use these electric scissors or some composite scissors to make about a 1 inch by 10 inch. Or you can take it over to the bandsaw. And then be sure and weigh the finished pieces as well.